like to welcome all of you very cordially to the Heinrich Bell Foundation. And I'm really surprised to see so many people here because it is already quite late. And obviously, some of you are interested in the question of how to become a feminist. I can't think of any better guest than Michael Kimmel, who is going to give a presentation and give us some advice as to how to become a feminist. And maybe he is also going to encourage some of us that it is worth becoming a feminist. It is not by coincidence or accident that the Gunda Werner Institute has invited you to this event tonight. It is one of the core features of the Gunda Werner Institute. It is sort of one of our guiding principles to focus on emancipation and gender equality of both women and men regarding all areas of society. And we are also very much interested in making counter drafts that have the ultimate goal of saying goodbye to traditional gender stereotypes. The GWI is well known for its clear strategy regarding gender-related issues. We focus on feminist and gender political topics, and we criticize stereotypes and we reflect upon the respective developments. Feminism gender policy and men's policy, these are the issues that we focus on. We would like to pave the way for gender democratic relations in our societies. Gender democracy is a guiding principle of the Heinrich Bell Foundation. Many people often don't understand what that is, but we try to walk the talk by focusing on these three topics that I have just mentioned. At the Gunda Werner Institute, we have a strong feminist group and we have a clear policy. We have ladies lunch for instance which is a very specific format and we are in the process of shedding light on the tension of gender relations in a very productive way. And that is based on a dialogue with men, because only if men are on board will we be able to tackle important gender-related issues. Now, the issue of men's policy being a very important pillar is one of our focal points at the Gunda Werner Institute. And when it comes to this focal point, we are very much interested in forging alliances with actors who are interested in emancipatory men's policy, in contrast to those who call themselves a men's activist and pursue an anti-feminist discourse and attack feminists. So we are interested in doing both, and I would like to make that very clear. I mean, we would like to foster alliances, forge alliances, and pursue a productive men's policy. But you know that we are confronted with massive attacks of so-called men's activist and anti-feminist men's alliances. Having said that, it is very important for us, and it is very close to our heart, to really critically deal with anti-feminist streams and groups. And therefore, this year, seems to be like last year, but it was this year, this year we conducted a study, we commissioned a study on anti-feminist men's rights movement with their mindsets, their networks, and their online mobilization. Now, when it comes to the actors, those who want to shed light on the policy and strategies of those anti-feminist men's activists, have to, those people have to expect drastic attacks, dramatic attacks. The reactions to the study that we have published ranged from libel conspiracies and very bad comments in newspapers and also a threat 
of killing the author. And we were particularly affected here in the foundation. I have never seen in the history of the foundation that people tried to use legal means in order to prevent us from publishing this study. I'm very pleased that we were successful against these legal activities that these men tried to launch against us when they tried to stop us publishing this study. They were unsuccessful. We won the lawsuits, and we were able to publish this study and the results of the study with some minor amendments that can be neglected. So rest assured, this battle against the anti-feminist men's activists was very time-consuming and it was in part also very exhausting. And Henning von Bargen, who is in charge of the men's policy of the Heinrich Bell Foundation, who is in charge of the emancipatory men's policy here, I would like to thank you very much for all your efforts and your activities in the last months and years. Thank you for spending so much time and efforts in your fight against these allegedly men's activists. Thank you. I am happy that the media coverage on that study was very good. There were numerous newspaper articles, radio contributions and features, and we ourselves would never have consider this to be possible, that there is the wish for a critical dialogue between the conservative ones, between the evangelical neo-Nazist camp when it comes to attacks on feminism and others. Now, if we have a look at the anti-feminist debate, then we can see that it is men today that present themselves as victims to a certain extent. It is those anti-feminist men's rights activists who claim today that they need gender equality. And it is no longer women who need gender equality. They say that it is them who need gender equality policies. And it is exactly those men who communicate nothing else but saying that the state is in the hands of feminist and sort of struggling with a gender machine. I think those who are experts on this issue know that this is not only something that the anti-feminist men's rights activists formulate, this is something that we can read in FAZ or other newspapers. And I think that we should really ask ourselves what that means. We should not only deal with right-wing populist evangelical attacks, but we should also deal with the attacks that come from the middle classes and things that are also formulated in those newspapers. Now, we need allies in order to pursue an emancipatory men's policy, and one of those allies is Michael Kimmel, our guest tonight. Michael Kimmel became a feminist voluntarily, and together with Michael Kaufmann, he published the book The Guy's Guide to Feminism. This guide, I read the guide, I had a look at it, I prepared myself to tonight's event. This guide is a totally new and funny access, access to feminism, to gender equality and gender roles and men's myths. Whether such a guy's guide to feminism will meet positive feedback in Germany, I don't know. It remains to be seen, and we are going to discuss that tonight, but only after Michael Kimmel has given his ideas regarding the book The Guy's Guide to Feminism. Again, a warm welcome, Michael. Michael Kimmel will start with a brief lecture. He's going to present his book. But I would also like to introduce Michael Kimmel very briefly. He's a sociologist and a professor at the Stony Brook University in New York. 
He is author and editor of numerous books that deal with men and masculinity-related issues. When it comes to masculinity, when it comes to dealing with that topic, I think he is a pioneer and a trailblazer to a certain extent. These books are very close to my heart because I have learned quite a lot. I have learned to also deal with the masculine and male side and perspective very intensively, and I learned a lot in that context. Michael Kimmel is also in the editor of the journal International Encyclopedia of Men and Masculinities. I'm mentioning that because it is important for you to know that there is such a publication. Encyclopedias are usually there to be used, uh, to be read, so to speak. So once again, I'm looking forward to listen to you and then afterwards definitely to talk with you. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I plan to, to do. Um, in a way, what I want to do is I, I not only just want to talk about the book a little bit, but I also want to talk about why we did it, uh, why we did this book the way we did, um, why we wrote a, a book that you know had, looks like it has a kind of a football diagram on it. Um, and basically, our our plan in this, and and as you said, you know, one of the things that's important to us is that you know we do it in a way that's somewhat humorous to make sure that people understand that that whole idea that feminists are not funny is entirely incorrect. Um, that was important to us. Um, but basically, it's 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 to, it's to make an argument in a sense that what feminism has achieved among women um, often doesn't resonate for men. Most men don't think about it, don't think it's about them, and so it remains distant, it remains foreign, it remains confusing, it remains potentially threatening to men. So our job in this book, in the way that we wrote it, was basically to, to say, listen guys, it's not that scary. You too can understand this. It's not, you're, it, not every feminist is angry at you personally. <laughs> um, and most important, and this is the point that I'm going to, the argument that I will make uh, in my remarks tonight, it's not only, not, not only it's, it's, it's also um, a good thing that the way we think about gender equality uh, the way we've come to think. Now, Michael Coffin listen, is from, from Toronto in Canada. I'm from the States. But I think the way we, in, um, in, in many of the industrial societies in Europe and in, in North America, think about gender equality, we are told to think of it as a zero-sum game. So what men think very often is that if women win, men are going to lose. Um, and, and this is typical because we live in a culture that basically has told us, you probably all know this, that women and men are from different planets. And, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And you probably have, you know, read your, your share of these kinds of, of, of ar arguments. Did you know, by the way, that John Gray's book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, is the best-selling self-help book in the history of the world? <laughs> that book sold 17 million copies. Just that book. That's men are from Mars, women are from Venus. That doesn't include the, you know, Mars and Venus in the boardroom, Mars and Venus in the bedroom. There, there should be someday Mars and Venus in the bathroom. Um, it doesn't include the DVDs, board games, pen and pencil sets, uh, videotapes, audio tapes. Uh, um, there was a game show on TV for a while. Um, and my favorite part of the Mars and Venus empire, the therapy franchise. You can be trained, really, I'm not, I'm not joking, you can be trained to do Mars and Venus therapy. Um, it takes two days. Um, and you go to, you know, corporate headquarters in Northern California, where else, and, and you get trained to do it. And then at the end, you come back, you hold out, you hang out a shingle that says you do Mars and Venus therapy, uh, and you send, you know, 10% back to headquarters, sort of like a tithe. And so, 
Um, but the thing about that book, which everybody knows the argument, and it's kind of the fallback default position in most cultures, is that men and women are so fundamentally different that we might as well be from different planets. And therefore, any amount of communication between women and men is an event of intergalactic proportions. <laughs> now, my argument is a little bit different than that. And so my argument, I, yes. So my argument is that women and men's interests are similar, that men and women are more alike than we are different, that we're all from planet Earth. I would love to write a book called We're All Earthlings, <laughs> but I don't think that will sell 17 million copies <laughs> because I think there's something, there's something in our culture that makes us want to believe we're fundamentally different, even though all of the available evidence suggests otherwise. Now, I want to make, what, what this book does is it tries to make that argument politically. It tries to say that the interests of women and the interests of men are similar. And that's kind of the case that I want to make to you tonight by talking a little bit about the book. So let me first start, start I think, where any conversation about, um, about gender uh, it, these days starts, which is, you know, if you want to talk about where men are at, you have to start, in a way, by talking about the enormous changes in women's lives. Um, because that's really, I think, where this conversation begins. So I'm going to, and I'm, I'm going to illustrate this. I have some, you know, some illustrations, some cartoons, and some other sort of various sorts of illustrations that I'll show you. But I also want to read one or two short entries from the book to give you an idea of what we what we are trying to establish. So the first one I'm going to read uh, for the translator. Thank you. Um, uh, I don't know how you do it, I'm, I have to admit. Um, it's miraculous to me. Um, but the, so the first one I want to read is, is called Autonomy. And the book, by the way, lists, you know, goes through the alphabet. You know, I figure we want to really do this easily, simply for guys. So we, the Guy's Guide to Feminism starts with A uh, and goes to Z. And we have entries for each letter of the alphabet. And so, you know, we sort of take a very systematic, here are all the issues that women have raised, all the issues that, you know, and, and here's how we can think about them. Here's how you can support them. And the argument that we make, of course, is why you should support them is, of course, because it's good for you, too. It is in your interest to support feminism as a man. And that's the case I want to make to you, so you'll hear that. So here's the, here's the, uh, the uh, entry on autonomy. Imagine that you couldn't vote or couldn't go to college. Imagine that you couldn't work. Or when you did, you couldn't join unions or hold certain jobs. Imagine that you couldn't serve on juries or hold public office. Imagine that you were prohibited from driving a car or from having a checkbook or a bank account with your own name on it. Imagine that stereotypes about you were the basis for discrimination in employment, housing, and education. Imagine that you couldn't own property in your own name. Imagine that in the eyes of the law, you were property. Imagine that you were afraid to walk on the streets of your own town or city, afraid to stay late at work or work late in the library, afraid to walk alone to your car in the parking lot. Imagine if you even felt afraid in your own home. Imagine that everywhere you turned, everywhere you looked, your body was being used to sell things, from automobiles to stereo equipment. This was the situation for women for most of the last two centuries. And it was against this that women has been, have been fighting. And boy, have they been successful. Most of those rights have been won, except, of course, the ability to live without the fear of violence. Feminism is a political ideology that fights for the rights of women to be treated equally, without discrimination, and to make their own decisions about how they will lead their own lives. The idea of autonomy is the heart of feminism. The radical idea, this is a quote, the radical idea that women are human beings, unquote as one feminist writer put it. Autonomy women, means women can choose to become what they want to become and to be safe in following their own path. Is this really such a radical idea? We don't think so. It's nothing more than what men take for granted as our inalienable right every single day. We believe, we believe that men should support women's autonomy because we believe in the rights of individuals to make their own choices about their lives. We believe that men care about the women in our lives, and we want our wives, our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our friends, our lovers, our colleagues, and our workmates to be happy, safe, and fulfilled as human beings. More than that, it will benefit us as men. It's more fulfilling 
and frankly more fun to be with people who are independent and strong, not supposedly weak, helpless, and dependent. It takes away some of the burden men often have to feel to feel like we're in control, make the decisions, be the provider, and know where we're going without asking for directions. Now, the thing about that, that's the entry, that's the entry on autonomy. Now, the thing about that is that if I were to say that, to, if I were to present feminism to my students today, 21, 22-year-old undergraduate women at my university, they would say, well, of course. But, you know, feminism, they say, this is 21-year-olds now in, in the States, would say, feminism was your generation's issue. You know, this was really important for your generation. And thank you very much, because we won. <laughs> we can now do anything we want. We can be anything we want. And, you know, and so thanks, but it's over now. We don't really have to think about it. Five years later, after they graduate and they've been in the workplace, they come back and go, you know what, you were right. <laughs> But students really do believe that you know, the whole world is available and, and possible to them. Now, this argument, so this, this is the first thing that I want to talk about, is this idea that feminism changed women's lives, that women's lives have changed utterly in the past half century, and thanks to, and thanks to the women's movement. Let me point to four ways in which women's lives have changed fundamentally. The first is really obvious. Women made gender visible. We now know that gender is one of the organizing principles of social life, one of the foundations of your identity. Let me tell you, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we didn't know that. 50 years ago, if you went to graduate school and said you wanted to study gender, there was not one course you could take. In fact, in my field, in sociology, if you went 50 years ago, if you went to graduate school and said, I want to study women, there was one course you could take. It was called Marriage and the Family. For years, that was like the ladies' auxiliary of the social sciences. Today, of course, there's women's studies courses, gender studies courses on every campus in the country. Women made gender visible. Other areas of change in women's lives. The workplace. Women have entered the workplace in unprecedented numbers in the past half century. Today, half of the labor force in the United States is female. Third is the balance between work and family. Not that long ago, women believed that they had to choose between having careers and having family lives. Not so my students today. My students today believe that they can balance work and family, that they can have you know, careers and warm, loving, supportive families to come home to, that women today want to, I love this phrase, have it all. You know, can women have it all? Can they have exciting, glamorous careers outside the, outside the home and warm, loving families to come home to at night? And the answer to that is, of course, no. Women can't have it all because men do. We're the ones who have the careers outside the home and the warm, loving, supportive families to come home to because women do the second shift. Women do the housework. Women do the childcare. We have it all. So if women are going to truly be able to balance work and family, we men will have to do something different. And I will return to this. Now, the fourth area of change that I'm going to talk about, and I will talk about this tonight uh, to hope to keep you all awake, um, is, is sex. Now, this is the hardest one for men to, to figure out because we thought the sexual revolution was all about us. I mean, look, the sexual revolution promised more access to more partners with fewer commitments. Could you come up with a more masculine definition of a sexual revolution than that? But if you look at the mountain of sex research data that has been collected over the past 50 years or so, there's only one conclusion you would come to, and that is it's women's sexuality that's changed, not men's. And the easiest way to describe this change in women's sexuality is to say women today feel entitled to pleasure. Women know that they can like sex, want sex, go for it, get horny. And I'm not talking about some bohemian enclave in, say, Berlin or Greenwich Village. Or, I'm talking about mainstream, you know, Victoria's Secret wearing mall going women. Most American young women, college women know that they are entitled to pleasure. This is revolutionary. You don't have to convince men of this. So these are four areas of change. And they're big ones, right? Identity, work, family, and intimacy. These are four big areas of change in women's lives. So one has to ask the question, well, while women's lives have been changing so quickly, so much, what's been happening with men? 
So, and here, this is a really interesting thing. We were just talking a few minutes ago about this. 25 years ago, when I first started teaching, um, I would ask my women students, what does it mean to be a woman? And they would give me your traditional feminine answer. Well, you have to be nice, you have to be quiet, smile, you know, don't make, ar you know, don't argue. And you'd ask the men 25 years ago, what does it mean to be a man? And they would say, John Wayne. <laughs> now, I ask the women, what does it mean to be a woman? And the women say, I could be anything I want. I could be a brain surgeon, an astronaut, a soccer player, a mom, anything. And you ask the men, what does it mean to be a man? They go, Arnold. <laughs> that is to say, the definition of femininity has changed utterly, and the definition of masculinity has changed relatively little. So let me talk then. First, let me say, what is that ideology of masculinity, the John Wayne to Arnold model? And then talk a little bit about, get inside what I think of as the, the reason that feminism has, impo has important resonance for men. Well, one psychologist came up with, to describe this ideology of, of masculinity, one psychologist came up with the four basic rules of masculinity. So if any of the men in this room are having any doubts or questions, just memorize these four rules, do them all the time, that's really important, and you'll be all right. Um, these are all idiomatic expressions, so I hope they translate in, in, re relatively easily for you. The first one, the number one rule of masculinity. Just get this one right, okay? No sissy stuff. <laughs> you can never do anything that even remotely hints of the feminine. Masculinity is the relentless repudiation of femininity. That's rule number one. Rule number two, be a big wheel. We measure masculinity by the size of your paycheck. Wealth, power, status. Um, we have this bumper sticker in, in, in the States that uh, some of you may have seen. It, it, it says, he who has the most toys when he dies wins. Right? Well, that's the second rule. Be a big wheel. The third rule, be a sturdy oak. A tree, right? What makes a man a man is that he's reliable in a crisis. What makes him reliable in a crisis is that he resembles an inanimate object. You know, a rock, a pillar. That's the third rule. And the fourth rule, give them hell. Exude an aura of daring and aggression. Live life out on the edge. Take risks. Go for it. Those are the four basic rules of manhood. Now, what I want to do for a few moments is I want to take those rules and I want to look at them through the lens of the changes in women's lives. And the first thing I want to talk about is why it is that when we say women made gender visible, gender remains relatively invisible to men. Most men don't think about it. Most men don't know that gender is as important to us as women understand it is to them. Most men think, you know, when you hear, when you hear the word gender, what gender do you think of? We're going to have a gender seminar. Seminar on women. So uh, most men don't think about this. Why not? Well, let me tell you my own story about how I start, first started thinking about this. This is a story that takes place about 30 years ago when I was a graduate student. And um, it's a story that will be so obvious that it couldn't take place today for very obvious reasons once I tell you. But 30 years ago, I was a graduate student. And you know how graduate students get. They get all excited about all these new ideas. And they run around and go, oh, did you see this latest article? So somebody said one day, you know, there is an explosion of writing and thinking in feminist theory. But there's no courses yet. So we did what graduate students typically do. We said, let's have a study group. We'll get together once a week. We'll read some text. We'll talk about it. We'll have a potluck dinner. So each week, 11 women and me got together. <laughs> we would read some text in feminist theory and talk about it. And during one of the meetings, I witnessed a conversation between two women that changed my life forever. One of the women was white and one was black. The white woman said, this is the part that's going to sound so anachronistic now, 30 years old now. The white woman said, all women have the same experience as women. 
all women are similarly situated in patriarchy, and therefore all women have a kind of intuitive solidarity or sisterhood. And the black woman said, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. So the black woman says to the white woman, when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, what do you see? And the white woman said, I see a woman. And the black woman said, you see, that's the problem. Because when I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, she said, I see a black woman. To me, race is visible. But to you, race is invisible. You don't see it. And then she said something really startling. She said, that's how privilege works. Privilege is invisible to those who have it. It is a luxury, I would say, to the white people sitting in this room not to have to think about race every split second of our lives. Privilege is invisible to those who have it. Now, you'll remember I was the only, um, I was the only man in this group. So when I heard this, I kind of went, oh. And someone said, well, what was that reaction? And I said, well, um, when I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, I see a human being. I'm kind of the generic person. You know, I'm a middle class white man. I have no race, no class, no gender. I'm universally generalizable. Um, so I like to think that was the moment I became a middle class white man. The moment that class and race and gender were visible to me for the first time. And that is really important because that was the first moment that I began, became aware of what I had not yet, had not been seeing up until that point. Now, I wish I could tell you, just as a, as a footnote to this, um, I wish I could tell you that that discussion ends uh, 30 years ago in that, in that little conversation, but I was reminded of it rather recently. Um, I have a colleague at my university, and she and I both teach sociology of gender. So when she teaches it, I always give a guest lecture for her, and when I teach it, she gives a guest lecture for me. So I, I was at her, um, I went into her class a couple years ago, a really big room, 300 students. I walk into her class to give a guest lecture. One of the students looks up and says, oh, finally, an objective opinion. <laughs> All that semester, whenever my colleague, my female colleague, opened her mouth, what my students saw was a woman. I mean, if you were to stand up in front of my students and say, there is structural inequality based on gender you know, in, in, in the United States, they would say, well, of course you'd say that. You're a woman. You're biased. When I say it, they go, wow, that's interesting. Is that going to be on the test? How do you spell structural? So, <laughs> so I, I hope that, I know that we're, we're broadcasting into the other room also. I hope that those of you in the back can see. This is what objectivity looks like. <laughs> you know, disembodied Western rationality <laughs> would be me. Um, <laughs> That's, by the way, just as a, for those of you who, are, who, who don't have a Y chromosome, let me explain. This is why we wear ties. Because if you are going to embody disembodied Western rationality, you need a signifier. And what could be a better signifier than disembodied Western rationality than a garment that at one end is a noose and the other end points to the genitals? <laughs> this is mind-body dualism right here. That's how we know. <laughs> Aren't you glad you didn't wear a tie tonight, honey? <laughs> you didn't know this was a prop. <laughs> so, all right, now, so this is why I think invisibility is important. And this is the kind of thing that we talk about when we talk about men's, about privilege. Um, this is another entry uh, in, the, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the book. Um, just about some of the privileges that men get, and I'm, I don't even need to read them to you. These are some of the privileges that men get just by virtue of being men, without having to do anything to earn it. It's not like we're, we were bad people and we're uh, you know, taking for ourselves all of this. This is stuff we get just because we are men. Um, and that, I think, is really important for us. We have to talk a little bit about that privilege being unearned, unasked for, but nonetheless conferred upon us. Now that means that breaking gender visible is political because it means making privilege visible. Um, but I'll just show you this for one more moment and then show you. So this is what I got. 
<laughs> as an email attachment. Last, uh, this is the this is something that's like both very flattering and not a little bit creepy. <laughs> so this this graduate of a Canadian university. Um, sends me an email saying, I just graduated from my university and I wanted to give myself a present, you know, as for graduation, and I'm sending you a photograph of it. That's the photograph. My words, <laughs> indelibly placed on her arm as a tattoo. I mean, at least it doesn't say, like, Michael. Forever. 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 So, I, as you can see, like, I was like, wow, that's flattering. Ooh. It's like... It's a little creepy to have your words indelibly tattooed on somebody. At least it didn't put quotes around it and put my name on it. Um, but there it is. But here's a better illustration of it. Actually, Lou, I think it was more than just my being in the right place at the right time. I think it was my being the right race, the right religion, the right sex, the right socioeconomic group, having the right accent, the right clothes, going to the right schools, etc. That's a little bit about what privilege means. It means that the inequalities that we experience, it's that, w that we observe, are not the result simply of individual volition. That means that when feminist women have been angry at inequality, it's not that they're angry at individual men for having chosen this. But once it's revealed, to choose not to intervene, to choose not, to, not is to perpetuate it. That's my first, my first argument. Now my second one is, why is it that men resist? Now I'm going to move to the second area in women's lives uh, changing, and that is the workplace. And I'll tell you another story about how I came to think of some of these kinds of issues. Um, because it's not just making privilege visible um, that, that, that we're talking about when we talk about making feminism accessible to men. There's also something else, and I, just want, I think I can illustrate this by telling you about another TV, you know, another uh, uh, experience in my own life. Um, some years ago, I was on a TV talk show. Uh, you've all heard of it, you know, black female host came out of Chicago. Um, and the thing, let me just say, we academics don't often get invited to be on talk shows because the talk show format is very polarized and very heated now. You know, it's yes, no, us, them, black, white. And what do academics do? We get up and we go, well, it's a little more complicated than that. You know, that is really bad TV. <laughs> um, so it's very rare to get invited to these kinds of shows. But there I was on Oprah, uh, opposite four, let us call them, angry white men. They were four men, not unlike the men you were describing, the ones in the, in the, in the newspaper as well. These were men who believed that they are, that white men today are the victims of reverse discrimination that they were qualified for jobs, qualified for promotions, that they didn't get, and boy, were they angry about it. And so they, had all, they were th there to, to talk about their grievances, how they were the victims, and then I was supposed to like, be the balance to this uh, and, and comment on it. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is I want you to hear the title of this particular show. And the title was a quote from one of these men. They all told their stories, um, and one of them said, and this was the title, A Black Woman Stole My Job. And then they told their stories about how they were qualified for jobs, qualified for promotions, they didn't get them, and they were angry about this. And so then Oprah turned to me, and I don't know, if it, did, have any of you actually ever watched the Oprah Winfrey Winf show? She was really quite, this was a particular genius that she had. She could be simultaneously admiring and condescending. She said, so, so what do you think about that, professor? <laughs> and I said, oh, I have just one question for these guys um, about the title of the show, A Black Woman Stole My Job. And it's actually a question about one word in the title. I want to know about the word my. Where did you get the idea it was your job? Why isn't the title of the show A Black Woman Got The Job or A Black Woman Got A Job? Because without confronting men's sense of entitlement, we will never understand why so many men resist gender equality. We think gender equality will be a loss for men. We think it's a zero-sum game. We think this is a level playing field. So any policy that tilts it even a little bit, we think, oh my god, water's rushing uphill. It's reverse discrimination against us. Let us be clear. 
white men in Europe and the United States are the beneficiaries of the single greatest affirmative action program in the history of the world. It is called the history of the world. <laughs> so that, but challenging it. So now look what, look, look, think about why we would not want to go there. To make gender visible means making privilege visible. To make privilege visible means making entitlement visible and then delegitimating it. So you can imagine why, like, let's not go there. So now what I want to do is I want to show through the, from the issues of the book some of the ways in which we, act, we actually have found that this is in our interest to do so. That it is in our interest to embrace gender equality in, in public and in our private lives as well. And to do that, I'm going to turn to the third area of change in women's lives the balance between work and family, and talk a little bit about men as parents. Um, I'm going to move to the entry on dads, page 31, for those of you translating while I'm talking like a New Yorker. Um, um, so uh, he says, uh, he, he's on his cell phone, he says, can I call you back? I'm creating happy memories of my childhood for my father, <laughs> which I particularly like. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so here's here's the model. That, how, you know, here's the model of parenting that we've sort of inherited. My wife's about to have a baby, so I was wondering if you could make me work late for the next 18 years or so. <laughs> the model of you know, but today, of course, young men are quite eager to be parents. We really want to be good parents. If you ask college age men, Gen Y men, millennials, they expect to be equal parents. They expect to be really involved fathers. They expect to be much more involved than their own fathers were. And so how do we talk about this? How do we talk about this discourse about, about men being active parents? Well, we have this, we have this phrase, uh, which I'm sure you've, you've encountered as well, about you know, quality time. Have you, have you seen that? Um, well, here's how, here's how I think it's working out for a lot of guys now. Uh, first of all, Harrington, let me tell you how much we all admire your determination not to choose between job and family. And the reason I love this cartoon is, look at these guys in the side. Do they look how admiring to you? Um, this is what happens to guys now. But the, but the data here are quite clear. Men today say they want to be better fathers. They expect to be, and they're putting in the hours to do it. So, what does that mean? It means that we want quality time with our kids. And this is the response we'll get from our kid. Quality time? Do I have to? You know, you say to your, you say to your son, come home early from school on Friday, we'll get together, we'll go out, kick that soccer ball, and do some bonding. Your kid is going to say, oh, sorry, Dad, I'm busy, but I'll text you. You know, so I have actually become a big believer in quantity time. Not quality time. Quantity time is putting in the long hours, doing the routine household tasks that nobody gets to be, you know, father of the year. Nobody gets an award for. Um, I could say this autobiographically. How I discovered this was probably the 43rd time I watched Toy Story with my then six-year-old. And, you know, and he cuddles into me and he says, oh, daddy, this is so great. I love you so much. And what you get, you know, you're supposed to go, ah, right? <laughs> but what you understand at that moment, parent, how many of you are parents? You know this, right? Come on, how many of you are parents? Ad admit it, okay. So what you know at that moment is that that would not have happened had you not also watched Toy Story 42 other times, <laughs> right? Um, there are some movies I have truly memorized. Um, so here's, here's what we say about fatherhood. Nowhere has feminism, this is the entry on dads, nowhere has feminism had a more wonderful impact on the lives of men than in our experience as parents. After all, feminism implores, encourages, and challenges men to be fully involved in parenting. It says we can do more than take our kids out for a special treat. We can actually be terrific parents. Most men have stood up and listened. Most new fathers we know want to play a much bigger role in, in, in raising their children than did their own dads or granddads. Sure, some of the work truly sucks, but it's the best thing that's happened to men since the invention of the TV remote. 
We still have our work cut out for us. In spite of these changes, women still won't do more child rearing in most families. This has limited their ability to pursue careers. And it's also a total drag if both of you work outside the home and she's the one stuck with most of the work looking after the kids. And because children need all the attention they can possibly get, women also know that those children who do have fathers around will benefit from them being present and active so long as these dads are loving and nurturing. Now, given that, I'm going to now I'm going to skip the Norwegian data for, you, for, for this audience. And I'll go right to the entry on housework. So balancing work and family requires not only shared parenting, but sharing the household chores. That is, housework and childcare. This is really kind of becoming an interesting phenomenon. And I suspect that this is equally true in Germany, where you would find equal numbers of young men saying, yes, of course I want to be a really involved father. And if you go to a playground here in Berlin any afternoon, you're likely to see a, lot, a significant percentage of the, of the parents there to be males. But here's what we're finding in, in the States. I'm a sociologist, so permit me to be a sociologist for a moment. When we measure people's family time, we are measuring housework and child care as a unit. So we ask how much housework and child care men and women do. And if you look at that data, you would see that men are doing somewhat, but not significantly more than they were doing 20 years ago. They're doing somewhat more. But the data aren't like off the charts. But so here's what's happening. That's an artifact of what we're measuring. What's happened in men's practices is that they have now separated housework and childcare. And they're doing virtually no more housework and boatloads more childcare than they were doing 20 years ago. And so what happens is dad is becoming the fun parent. Dad takes the kids to the park and they play soccer and they have a great time. And mom, meanwhile, makes the beds, does the laundry, makes the lunch that they come home to. And the kids come back and say, we had such a great time in the park with dad. He's such a good parent. <laughs> so obviously, this is a way that, that inequality becomes reproduced in practice, even though in theory, men are saying and doing more, more housework and child care when seen as a unit. Now, what I want to say to you here, here's the, um, the last bit of an entry that I'll read to you. Um, it's the entry on housework um, for those in the booth. Um, so here, here's what, I'll just read you a couple of pa paragraphs of this. Um, here's the thing about housework. It's work, you chowder head. Of course it's not all fun. Why do you think women have said they don't want to be stuck doing most of it? On the other hand, work or not, there's something about housework that's basic to being human. After all, housework is the way people take care of each other in everyday life. You're a man of action? Well, this is the action of caring for someone else and also looking out for ourselves, even if that action sometimes sucks. The problem has been, and still is, that women get stuck with doing much more of this. Yes, many of us work damn hard to equalize housework, but overall, even in households where both partners work outside the home, women do the large majority of it. One study from the National Survey of Families and Households shows that among married couples, men do about 30% of the housework, 14 hours per week, compared to 31 hours per week for their wives. Now, this is an increase from the 1970s when men did 10%, so it is going up. Perhaps you can say there are good anatomical reasons why we don't do more. This is the Mars and Venus one. Why don't we bake? Imagine it getting caught in the oven door. And don't get us started on the dangers of vacuuming. Then again, maybe not. There's nothing natural about men copping out of housework. After all, many men pride themselves at being good with power tools, except sewing machine food processors and vac vacuum cleaners. And if men are so biologically ill-equipped to sew or cook, how come the most famous surgeons and chefs are all male? So it's great news that we're seeing fantastic change in North America, parts of Europe, Australia, and among other couples here and there around the world. Until the rise of feminism, most women were convinced that it was their lot in life to clean up not only after themselves, but also after the men in their lives. Particularly with the rise of two-income families, the absurdity of this assumption is ever more apparent. 
Women working outside the home said clearly they didn't want to get stuck doing the second shift while their guy could relax or play or focus on work or studies at night and on weekends. This was just plain unfair. Not only unfair, but actually turns out to not be so good for men. The data here are pretty impressive, so I'm going to share it with you. There's two studies that I want to talk about. Really interesting. Um, there's a psychologist at the University of Washington named John Gottman. Um, he's, the, he's the marriage doc, and you can Google him. Uh, you know, just Google the marriage doc. Um, he's, and he's a psychologist, and he, you know, and he predicts if he, if, if he meets a, a married couple and talks to them, he says for 30 seconds, he can tell you whether they're going to stay together or not. Right? Yeah, right. Pretty impressive. Or maybe just a little bit exaggerated and hyperbolic. Okay. So anyway, he has, he, he's done this study in which he found that the happier, that, that the more egalitarian the couple, the more equal the couple, the happier they both are. The more likely they are to stay together. That couples that are more equal are more likely to stay together. This is what he finds. So now I'm a social scientist, so how would you measure this equality? Right? Well, there's some sociological research on this. The sociological research basically finds that there are two variables that predict equality in a marriage. One variable is, remember, we're talking about cross-cultural research from you know, pre-industrial cultures to the most industrial, is does the woman own property in her own name after marriage? So some measure of women's economic autonomy, that's what you'd be looking for, some variable on women's economic autonomy. The second variable, much more applicable in, in, in advanced societies, is this. How much time does the man spend doing housework and childcare? The more housework and childcare he does, the more equal the relationship. So why should he do it? Here's what the data show. When men share housework and childcare, so now, now we're not into making privilege visible. Now we're not into the entitlement stuff. Now we're making the case that gender equality is a good thing for us. Okay, so here it is. Number one, when men share housework and childcare, their children do better in school. When men share housework and childcare, their children have lower rates of absenteeism. They are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. They are less likely to teach, see child psychiatrists. They are less likely to be put on, me, on prescription medication. They are less likely to be absent they are more likely to be high achieving. They are more likely to say they're happier. So when men share housework and childcare, their children are happier, healthier, and do better in school. All right, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and childcare, their wives are happier. Duh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but not only that, their wives are healthier. Their wives work out more. They have more more time. Um, they, they are less likely to see a therapist, less likely to be diagnosed with depression, less likely to be taking prescription medication. So when men share housework and childcare, their wives are happier and healthier. Okay, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and childcare, the men are healthier. They smoke less, they drink less, they take recreational drugs less often, they are less likely to see a psychiatrist, they are less likely to be diagnosed with depression, they are, le they are more likely to go to a doctor for routine screenings, but less likely to show up in the emergency room. When men share housework and childcare, the men are healthier. They're not only healthier, but they are happier. They report much higher rates of, of marital satisfaction, much lower rates of depression. Okay, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and childcare, they have more sex. Of these four really interesting findings, which one do you think Men's Health Magazine put on its cover? <laughs> housework makes her horny. Uh, parentheses, not when she does it. Uh, Taking five minutes in the evening to take out the trash and load the dishwasher could improve your marriage and your sex life. In a recent study of 3,500 people, researchers at California Riverside found men who perform the most chores around the house are extremely sexually attractive to their partners. 
and have the best relationships with their children. It also makes wives feel loved and more like equals, which increases their interest in sex, says John Gottman, the marriage doc. <laughs> so there it is. Men have now are in relationships. Those are the men in this room who are in relationships. Let me be very clear about this data. This data was collected over a really long time in the aggregate. I don't want you to be sitting out there thinking, hmm, OK. So baby, I just dropped the kids off at school, and now I'm going to the grocery store, and then I'm going to go home and unload the car. Am I making you hot? <laughs> Washing the dishes tonight is not going to, this is data, as I say, collected over a really, really long period of time. But, but it does lead, I believe, to an important, uh, an important conclusion as well. And that is that feminism, gender equality in our relationships, is not about them versus us, but it is a win-win for both women and men. Um, that women have, but I will also say um, that it leads to a certain amount of arrogance, I suspect. But it's also led, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's also led to a whole new genre of pornography. So you didn't think I was going to be, you didn't, you didn't expect me to be showing you pornography at the end of my talk, but here it is, porn for women. <laughs> well, I can't offer you any solutions, but I am a good listener. <laughs> Breakfast is on the table, and I'll have your outfit ready in five minutes. <laughs> Aren't you getting turned on? Come on. <laughs> and this is my favorite. As soon as I finish the laundry, I'll do the grocery shopping, and I'll take the kids with me so you can relax. Now, this is a little bit, you know, this book by, by, by published the porn, porn for Women by the Cambridge Women's Collective um, does, get, does suggest something, I think, important. And that is the argument that we make in Guy's Guide to Feminism is really quite simple, is that women have identified issue after issue. If you disaggregate these and you present them, most, most college-age women today if you ask them, do you support this, 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 and this, if you took the you know, feminist top 10 policy initiatives, they would all agree with all of them. If you ask them, are you a feminist, they would say, no. I, I, I like wearing makeup. I like men. I like shaving. All of these, you know, the, the stereotypes about what feminism means has become so pervasive. The same thing is true of men. If you presented to men, of college age, feminist top 10 policy initiatives, most college age men would agree with them as well. So this is not about the policies. This is about our personal lives. It's about the, it's claiming the name, owning the fact that this name sort of is an umbrella for all of those different ideas and all of those policies. And the argument that we tried to make in Guy's Guide to Feminism is really quite simple. A, feminism is understandable by men. It is, not so, 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 uh, it is not so complex and difficult. Second, that it is not a, a Mars-Venus issue, that it is in fact an Earthlings issue, and that the very things that women have identified as the things that will make their lives better are the very things that we men need to make our lives better as well. And that's why guys not only need a guide to feminism, but that's why in fact we need feminism itself. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this very entertaining lecture. I mean, you communicated these serious issues in a very good and entertaining way. Thank you so much. Very briefly, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this event. I wasn't introduced. Let me briefly tell you who I am. My name is Andreas Gouzes. And I come from the forum Men in Theory and Practice for Gender Relations. I'm the spokesman of this organization. We are based here in Germany, and we comprise of people who want to contribute to gender democracy and gender equality. And together with Michael Kimmel and Barbara Unmissig, I have the great chance to discuss these issues here tonight. We will discuss on the panel first, and then we will open the discussion to the audience after that. Okay, so 
as a psychologist and as a person who mainly works with men as a psychotherapist. And of course, I am very much interested in those issues. I mean, you talked about those 30 seconds that obviously Mr. Gutman can say after 30 seconds whether a couple will stay together or not. I feel very bad because my therapy takes a little longer than 30 seconds, but that's a separate issue. You would become unemployed, wouldn't you? Yes. There's a lot of work to do still. That also became clear today. My interest is to sketch new ways and pathways for men. We try to find out how other forms of masculinity can be lived. But we might come back to that in a second. Barbara, I wanted to address you first. What is your first impression? Barbara. I mean, for me, it was very exciting to listen to that entertaining lecture. What do you think? Well, I, I think share that view. It was really entertaining, funny. We would wish to have men in Germany who advertise gender equality in such an entertaining and funny way. I particularly liked this playful approach. So you talked about the privileges of men in a very playful way. And I liked that. What I liked as well was that you don't do that by criticizing others, but that you do that in a playful way. This is exactly what we need. We need the, a level playing field for both men and women. Emancipation is not turning around gender roles. Emancipation for me means that household chores and other things that people usually do not like are shared between the two. And you communicated that in a very good way. However, there's one thing that sort of bothers me. Also, when I was reading the book, it sort of bothered me. Maybe I'm very German now, but that is your reasoning for feminism, gender equality. You're saying it has to be fun, so men can benefit from that because it can be fun. And here I say, yes, of course, fun. But for me, a key issue is that it is not utilization oriented. I mean, what it comes down to is laying a foundation for equality and equal rights. So we need equal rights for both men and women. It comes down to human dignity and human rights. I mean, these are inalienable rights. And it has to be very clear that this is the prerequisite for everybody. So equality and human dignity, this is equal rights. And this is something that I would like to pass on to you. If I say, ha ha, if men or if women are the same as men, are equal to men, then life becomes funnier and better for men. Yes, of course, but there is a certain touch in that, in that that I dislike, and I would like to talk about that with you a little bit. Okay, so let us pick up that argument. Michael, you do both. This is at least how I understood you. You ex show and you sketch what the topic is, but you also shed light on the resources, on the benefits that they have. And this is what I like. This is also an issue that I deal with in my therapy sessions. It's not only giving up things. It's not only about sacrificing things. It is about a win-win situation at the end of the day. But maybe you would like to respond to that yourself. You talked a lot already, but maybe you would like to say a little more. You don't have to respond right away, but if you like, you can do that. Want me to speak to this, to this first question? Sure. Uh, let me say, uh, let me let me speak to the, the both issues. First of all, uh, since you both mentioned the question about being entertaining, um, I think uh, that there's a politics to to that, um, and not only just to, to show that you know feminists and feminists have sense of sense of humor, um, but also. Um, I found, and, and this speaks directly to your question, yes, of course that's true. Yes, of course, it's a question of human rights and human dignity. When you present the eth what you would say the ethical imperative to men about gender equality, when you would say to men, you should support gender equality because it's fair, it's just, it's right, it's good, you, you present the ethical imperative, they say, yeah, okay, fine, 
uh, and they will, they, and at best, you will get an abstract, an abstract acceptance of that as a sort of a policy position. But what I want is I want men to take it inside. I want men to, to do this in their practices. I want them to be able to be willing to support the women in their lives and to also stand up to the men in their lives and intervene so it's not only falls on you. That means they have to personally, emotionally commit. So I want to also tell them it's in your interest to do so. I, I completely agree with you. We shouldn't have to. And so I, my critique, my own critique of my, of my work is that it's very American in that respect. Because it's all about That's personal true. life and it's going to be better and, and you're, you know, it's, it's in your interest. You know, we love, I mean, I can, if I could make it a market, I would, you know, um, <laughs> right? I mean, Definitely. right? I mean, I want to, I want to make it, you know, I, so in a sense, it's a very American model, um, it, you know, and especially the focus that we have in my talk, for example, on personal life, on relationships rather than, as one might do, on public life, on, on political policy issues, on, on, you know, on, 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 on economic or, or, or uh, political I issues. Um, in that sense, I, you know, I, I, it is that. But I think that there's a reason for it. And it's not, and that plus, you'd wish that the ethical imperative would be enough, but it's not. You just wanted to respond to that, didn't you? Well, let me reformulate it. But now let me be very serious. I want to address that issue because I take that sort of seriously. I work on international issues first and foremost. We at the Heinrich Bell Foundation work in countries where there are very tough patriarchal and traditional structures, gender relations, that is. We are not only talking about how this works in our society. Maybe this entertaining approach doesn't work in other societies at all. And often I hear in those countries that we have to work with men because we can only get access to women via men. If we want to educate women, if we want to offer a healthcare system to women, we have to go via the men. Or when it comes to political participation of women, we have to go through the men, we have to address the men because they give their consent, they give their consent to medical treatment, etc. So these are totally different issues in those countries, but at the end of the day it comes down to the following. I always have to ask myself, is that a tactical issue? and approach, or do I still have the opportunity to address the patriarchal relations in this country, X, Y, Z? Let's take Pakistan as an example. And how we do that? How do we do that in such a country? What is tactics in that? And access, and what is gender stereotypes and power relations, and breaking those up? And in another cultural context, that looks totally different from an industrialized country like Germany, Europe, or the United States. I mean, it is definitely different. So it is a basic, it is a fundamental issue as to how do you work with men in general. Um, I, you know, this is, uh, of course you're right. And my, my feeling about this is, uh, is that why would we have to choose? It is absolutely important to take the conditions that we find on the ground at any one moment. If the only way a woman can get prenatal health care is with her husband's consent, we have to work with the men. And while we do that, we want to begin to engage in a larger critique of what is the legitimacy of this in the first place. Yes, of course. So, so these are these are not. This is, you don't have to make a choice. These are in some ways a time, a temporal issue. Now we deal with the reality of these, uh, of these circumstances toward a much larger goal where we open up these conversations in the future. So I, and, and what I'm suggesting um, is, and in so many of the, of the uh, you know, of, of conflict societies or, or um, less, industri less industrial societies, um, the issues of men's direct control of women's bodies whether or not, I mean, not only their sexual bodies, but especially their, their, their healthy bodies, 
their reproductive bodies, um, requires that we actually engage the men. Now, some of the projects that I've been aware of, for example, throughout the world in, in these countries, um, have been engaging with men precisely around both of these issues at the same time. So, for example, uh, one of the most successful uh, organizations that I know of, Promundo, um, in Rio, works with, young, uh, with, uh, with gangs in favelas in, in Rio de Janeiro. And, uh, of course, immediately they work on issues of violence among the, bo the boys and violence against women, because violence against women is epidemic. And then, so they start with their men's entitlement to women to, to, to violence, men's entitlement to violence against women, and then they broaden it into a much larger critique. So, so I, I see these not as a choice, um, but rather as, as one following on the other. Absolutely, we would support you know, the, the intervention here and now on protecting, uh, you know, making sure that, that women, individual women, can actually get more, better access to the kind of services that they need. But in the future, how do we also then engage men in a larger conversation? For example, how do we engage men in a larger conversation about, about uh, contraception, where unlike uh, Germany and the United States, where vasectomy is one of the more preferred routes of, of, of birth control? Right? That requires men's engagement, Mexico, Latin America particularly. You know, uh, that, that you know, so, so going through men is really vital. How do you, in so now, if you're going to do that, you must engage with them about their ideas about masculinity mm -hmm. and, um, and reproductive power. You have uh, engage about uh, potency, fertility, the, the connection of potency and fertility. So now you're talking masculinity. Now you're not just talking about sort of, getting better access for women. But the consequences of this, of course, are better access to, you know, better lives for women as well. Well, actually, it is about both, if I understand you correctly. So do one thing and not do the other thing. I mean, it is about clear political positions and advertise them. I mean, Henning von Bargen and myself, we wrote an article on our work and activities with men, and this article says that men's work needs a clear political standpoint. And to define this standpoint and to say, this is what we think and this is how we work and this is how we address men. I mean, in that context, I think it is very vital to have men who argue from their position. And here I share the view that you have just sketched. At the same time, we should make sure that we also shed light on political issues, but not only on political issues, but also on other aspects. And I would like to come back to one of the aspects that you mentioned. Men's policy is a pillar of the GWI. This is what you mentioned in the beginning, Barbara. Men's policy, what is what you want to pursue and what you pursue here at the foundation. Maybe we Germans are a little more complicated than the academics who say, well, we have to take a more differentiated approach. At the Men's Forum, we do not call ourselves feminists, but we call ourselves pro-feminist activists. So we have our very clearly defined standpoint. Men's policy is definitely a vital pillar, as you mentioned it. However, I would like to know more from you. What is the situation like in the United States? especially the situation when it comes to men's movements. What opportunities are there? What support do you have in the US? Are there any programs, governmental programs, in order to educate men and women, in order to pursue a very concrete policy? Uh, there's two. There's two parts of your of your question that I want to address. The first is the uh, the terminology, the feminist, pro-feminist. Uh, 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 question. And the second is what sort of uh, men's movements there are in, in the States. And uh, the first thing I'll say is, you know, when I first started um, doing this work, um, I was very careful to differentiate uh, a being pro-feminist from being feminist. And my reasoning was very simple. Um, in order to support feminism, you only need to basically have two things. You have to have one empirical observation, which is women and men aren't equal. And the second is a moral position, and they should be. And that's really all you need. Uh, it's, you know, if you observe that women and men aren't equal, and you think they should be, you support feminism. That's basically my position. But to call yourself a feminist, to be a feminist, I thought at the time, 
um, required that you actually also had to have the felt experience of that inequality, which I didn't have, of course. And it would be analogous to my calling myself a black militant as opposed to anti-racist or a gay liberationist as opposed to gay affirmative, right? So I didn't call myself a feminist. I called myself a pro-feminist. My feeling is that, that you know, some you know, quarter of a century later, uh, feminism has been so relentlessly attacked that anybody who wants to call themselves a feminist, I'm pretty much okay with, um, because you know, it, it, you know, it, because it, it's the, it's simply saying, you know, I want to occupy this space that has been so discredited publicly for such a long, so relentlessly for such a long time. So I'm okay with that in a, in a little bit. I'm more okay with it. But I, I agree with you politically. I, I, I share the the idea. But let me just say a couple of things. Here's, here's the way I see the way in which the men's movements, and I'll say that as, as plural, um, have, fa have organized themselves or responded to the, 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 some of the observations of feminism. Feminism basically had two levels, the personal and political. At the personal, at the political level, the, that empirical observation, feminists uh, argued that women were not in power. Well, this is pretty obvious. You know, you look at every single parliament, every single board of trustees, every single corporate board, every single academic uh, hierarchy, and you'll see that women as a group are not in power. And the second part of what feminism said was individual women do not feel powerful. So feminism was designed to redress both, to change the aggregate power imbalance at the top and to empower women to make to feel more autonomous and make better choices in their own personal lives. So now you apply that to men. Nice and nice parallelism for women. Men are in power. Right. Everybody agrees with, with that part. Therefore, men must feel powerful. Eh, wrong. That's the part where in the 1970s when we would go to men and say, Men have all the power. Men have to give up the power. Did you ever hear this, these, these lines? And the men would say, what are you talking about? I don't have any power. My wife bosses me around. My kids boss me around. My boss bosses me around. I'm completely powerless. So the, for women, you had to address the symmetry between women's aggregate powerlessness and personal feeling of powerlessness. For men, you had, to, it, you had to address the dissimilarity between all the aggregate power in the world, not Reagan to the side, trickling down to individual men feeling powerful. So the men's movements are all about that relationship between aggregate power and men not feeling powerful. The men's rights groups say, you know how you don't feel powerful? You're right. We have no more power. The women have it all now. Let's go get it back. That's the men's rights position. Then there's the mythopoetic position. You know how you don't feel powerful? Let's go off to the woods. We'll do the power drumming, the power chanting, the power, you know, the power rituals. We'll feel powerful. Sort of like, you know, yuppies with their power ties, as if power was a, a fashion accessory. Um, and the, and the pro-feminist men's movement says it is exactly that discrepancy between the aggregate political power and the fact that you don't feel powerful that is the, that is the, the lever that we want to be using to talk to men. All that power didn't make you feel powerful. Is it possible that more gender equality at the top will actually make you feel more powerful in your personal life? Right? Isn't that a possibility? Can you entertain that as a possibility? Since all the power in the world didn't do it, maybe equal power at the, in the aggregate will actually free you to feel more powerful, to live the life you actually say you want to live. And that is the key piece in all of this. We are not you know, imposing some you know, Obama-esque socialist blue state feminism on unsuspecting men. We are taking men at their word. Men want to have good relationships. They want to be good fathers. So let's take them at their word. This is the only way you're going to do it. So that, so it's in, in that respect, um, th this is now. Now you ask the third question, which is, are there any government policies and programs and all of that? Most of these come are are non-governmental organizations. Um, the only ones that have any kind of, that on the pro-feminist side, the only ones that have any, you know, 
consistent political uh, support, uh, you know, that is to say financial support, are those programs that work with court-mandated batterers in violence prevention programs. So men who have been convicted already of, uh, of, of, of uh, domestic violence um, are offered a choice between going to prison or going to therapy group. So you can imagine what they choose, but you could also imagine how high their motivation is to change, because all they have to do is show up. Right? So. I do not want to react to this, but I would like to take advantage of this opportunity. What is emancipatory men's policy? That's my question to you. How is it constituted? I think we can easily find an agreement. The men's manifesto and other documents show it quite clearly. There are things uh, and uh, men that feel an attachment to the emancipatory field, that the ultimate goal would be the political equality, the dismantlement of inequality in power relationships, political power relationships, uh, I would say. That's equality, gender equality, the same participatory rights, uh, access rights. That would be the uh, prerequisites for emancipatory men's policy. However, I think uh, it would be advisable to see, and I perceive Michael Kimmel in a different light. In Germany, the question is not so much, how can I support feminists, but it's rather about uh, dealing with your own gender role and to tackle the issues of identity policy. That's one thing. The other thing is, and I also find this uh, reflects in the emancipatory battlefield, it's about the impairments and the damage that is done through gender stereotypes. For example, that men are affected too and are impaired too, that we don't have a gender differentiated health diagnostic uh, it's not only women that suffer from this deficit of a gender differentiated health policy, but it's also men. Then we have in uh, Germany this entire debate that's uh, raging now about boys as the big losers in our educational system. You are giving the answer. No, I'm not giving an answer. I just wanted to talk about some observations. We see the first inklings, the tiny appearance of emancipatory movements here in Germany. I would like to learn from you what are the issues that uh, are most on the minds of those who participate in m the forums on men's policy. And what I find very good is uh, to reflect on your own gender roles, on your stereotypes that uh, form your identity. And it's quite stressful stereotypes that uh, hinder you, that are obstacles to you. And the second question is, what are the issues that the people address? The question went to me. But also to Michael Kimmel, yeah, because I'm eager to learn what constitutes emancipatory men's policy, because I think we need to discuss this. Let me try to get this right. In Germany, for the Forum Men, the Men's Forum, well, first, uh, uh, our objective is to dismantle existing inequalities, and second, uh, to become proactive. How can we make a contribution to establishing new models of living together and to establish uh, Gen new gender relationships and gender democracy. As to the first point, it has always been one of our arguments. Uh, you said that there was a process going on. Twelve years ago it started when we got together, when quite few men were willing to address this issue of men's policy. Then we took a more clear-cut political stance 
and we reached the conclusion that we asked ourselves, what is our contribution to this change? How can we reach out to men? It has always been an issue. And then it's at the same time also a, a challenge to men. How can we open up to other men? How can we illustrate alternatives? Uh, and how can we analyze what's going on in our society? Where do we find difference? The other thing is we want to make a contribution with a clear reference to the future. What may future hold in store? There are proposals made by men, how they define themselves, uh, living different types of masculinity. We want to shed light on this. We want to make it more transparent. What are alternative forms of masculinity? We want to enter this argument. Politically speaking, well, there is not so much around issues that have been taken up again and again. There's uh, three issues. First, uh, paternal time, paternal leave, as it is called, but also male educators in nursery schools and the boys' day. These three things have been brought forward by the government. On the 3rd of November, it's specifically about our contribution to gender policy and to gender democracy. What misses still in this report on equality? The topic of migration, health issues. Once again, we need to highlight the specific features. Why are women disadvantaged? And what does it mean? What does it mean to be caught in this male role? And for example, dying six years earlier than women? which is not so enticing. Well, I, uh, much could be said about that. I, I pass the floor to Michael. Oh, I'll be very brief, because we do. We, we have this plan that you're going to get to talk to, so I want to leave some time for that. And Mark, if I, if I leave anything out, you know, remind me. But I'm, I'm reminded of the project that we've been working on. Um, it, it, when you ask about, Barbara, when you ask about emancipatory politics, so let me just say that I, mean, I, would, I would point to you know, four, four different things. The first is I would say that part of this project is um, engaging men to support those, uh, those uh, equality issues that women have identified, wage discrimination, uh, uh, corporate board uh, participation, you know, all of those things that we could, we could enumerate, you know, a, a list of them. Engaging men support on those. The second thing is what are the points of entry for men? Um, one, the, and, and we've identified them. One is uh, men's care work. That is to say, housework, child care, relationship with children. Two, education. Uh, attending to the needs of boys, not in opposition to the needs of girls, but in concert with the needs of girls. Um, the, the boy crisis that we've been seeing um, is entirely, in my mind, misframed. Um, and, uh, and, and it's been it entirely been, a, 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 you know, an idea that boys have suffered because, you know, girls have leapt ahead so much. And I don't think that that's an accurate reading at all. The third, um, the third area, of course, is health. This is a major point of entry for men, right? Because this is a place that directly affects their own self-interest. So um, sc early, earlier screenings, pro uh, more ac accurate testing, engaging men in the kinds of screenings and tests that women, uh, you know, women undertake, you know, uh, gynecological tests far more readily, far more regularly than men do. So that requires confronting masculinity, right? Uh, and the fourth, of course, the fourth area, of course, is violence. And there, of course, clearly, again, sticks and carrots. The stick is no more, right? The carrot is why not, right? Why? Because you'll have better relationships. That's why. Why shouldn't you? You know, it, it's not enough to just set limits and police. It's also a matter of engaging. So you ask for an emancipatory, uh, emancipatory poli political agenda, it would be around care work, education, violence, engaging men to support the areas of, of discrimination against women, and, and one more that I left out, um, health. That, there it is in 30 seconds. <laughs> Great, I think you wrapped it up beautifully. I will be very brief, just as an example. 
Gitte Henschel, who is a co-director of the Gunda Werner Institute, together with Henning von Bargen. She could talk for hours how difficult it is to engage men in, for example, violence against women during war or crisis prevention. It's a hardcore issue. Women are heavily affected. We hardly ever will we get male allies that support us on a gender perspective in themes like gender and security. Although there is a clear-cut uh, proof uh, that there is an issue here, but you will find very few men. But these are really worlds apart. Uh, it would be so great to have more allies, uh, not only with reference to identity policy, but with reference to hardcore issues, economic issues. It would be great if we had a men's campaign that was we do not want the um, tax uh, deduction for couples because it is to the disadvantage of women. And we could talk about this uh, equality for same-sex uh, couples. Uh, one would ask, why would we extend such a bad privilege to same-sex couples? Well, equality, yes, does matter, but the wrong policy, why should it extend also to uh, new issues such as same-sex couples? Uh, men support women in dismantling uh, inequality. Well, they are most welcome. And the other thing is, well, I greatly admire them. I love them. I think Michael Kimmel has... Uh, made uh, wonderful proposals uh, that we all could benefit from if we were able to translate it into concrete practice, if we look at it. What is good access? And here I can I learn from you. I want to support this. Uh, uh, let me open up.